one thing I've learned to cherish is time. Time. Time is a precious commodity. Really not here on earth for very long. It was two years ago on this day that my father went home to be with Jesus. James 4, 14 says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. I think the Lord Jesus also tried to teach his disciples about the importance of time when he said in John 9, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who has sent me, for the night cometh when no man can work. Disciples of Christ should value time, they should redeem the time, they should occupy until he comes again. We should be aware of the seasons and the times in which we live, and we should make the most of it with the days that we have left on earth. The way to make the most of our time is by making the most of our walk in our relationship with God. And to assist us in this journey, I'd like to read from one of our texts this morning out of Psalms chapter 1. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does, it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Father, thank you for this allotted time. May it speak volumes to our hearts. Hide me behind your cross today, Lord, as I minister your word to our church, our family. God, take us on a journey with you today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now before you're seated, tell your neighbor, I want to walk closer to the Lord. I want to walk closer to the Lord. Amen. In Psalm 1, we have a plea for a deeper, more solid, more productive walk with God. I believe Psalm 1 is a roadmap for a true disciple of Christ. To make the most of our walk with God, we'll need to carefully look in three directions and answer three questions. And the first is this. We must look around. In other words, how are you being influenced? There are only two possible ways you can be influenced in this life. Either we're influenced with godly things or with ungodly things. We need to look around and ask ourselves this question. What are the things that I'm allowing in my life to influence me, to shape me, to mold me, especially my way of thinking and ultimately my behavior or actions. King David, the writer of Psalms 1, knew a little bit about influence. He was a shepherd boy who became a king. He knew life in the pasture, but he also knew life in the palace. He starts out by talking of the ungodly influences. When he says in Psalms 1, 1 and 2, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the godly, nor stands in the seat in the path of the sinners, nor seats in the seat of the scornful. One thing I've learned in life, and all parents will attest to this truth, you don't have to teach kids to be bad. They learn that quite well on their own. The Bible says we are by nature children of wrath. 
We must be delivered, be delivered from wrath and thank God in Christ Jesus He has rescued us and made us children of God through His marvelous grace. Amen? Amen. Yet we must also be aware of ungodly influences throughout our life on earth. Please note the stages of ungodliness. It begins by walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk speaks of a direction that a person is going. And if you continue to go in that direction, you'll end up in a place that you don't want to be. We should turn from ungodly counsel. In other words, don't go in that direction. Some people start their day by reading the horoscope. That's the counsel of the ungodly. Yeah. Some people will consult some psychic they heard on TV. That's demonic. Stay away from it. Yeah. Some folks will listen to talk show psychobabble and get counsel on how to deal with their lives. That's just plain stupid. Some people will purchase a magazine to read about how to make life work, which nowadays is not worth the paper it's printed on. When we go into the direction of the worldly wisdom forsaking godly wisdom, we are under ungodly influences, and it doesn't end there. The next step after walking in the counsel of the ungodly is standing in the way of sinners. After we go in the direction of seeking advice of the ungodly, we move from consulting the ungodly to identifying with their position. Standing speaks of taking a position on an issue. Oh, I was glad <laughs> on Wednesday to join millions of others to stand in line at Chick-fil-A to make a stand, hallelujah, for the things that are right. But for the sinner, they first walk to the ungodly voices of the world, and then they begin to stand and take sides with their causes. They identify with the position. Friend, hear me clearly today. There's only one position that's worth having, and that's God's position. Hallelujah. There's only one viewpoint we're seeing, and that's God's viewpoint. Everything else must go in the trash can. The world will tell you marriage is okay between a man and a man and a woman and a woman and a man and a dog and a giraffe. Let me tell you, that is not the wisdom of God. Amen. That's the wisdom of the carnal world. If an abortion is okay, don't stand on that position, it will fall. So the stages of ungodliness does not just stand with walking in the counsel of the ungodly or standing in the way of sinners. Eventually, you arrive at sitting in the seat of the scornful. Sitting speaks of a resting place. Some of you are sitting today, and you've already begun your rest. Wake up! <laughs> sitting speaks of landing on a position that we feel very comfortable with. First, we walk around some ungodly counsel. Then we begin to stand around the ungodly voices. And finally we adopt ungodliness into our lifestyle. We pull up a chair and we take our place in the seat of the scornful. Who would have ever dreamed that we would give a license? For two people of the same sex to be married legally. We're sitting in the seat of the scornful. We embrace ungodliness and we scoff and mock at everything that's holy and godly. But friend, God is not mocked. The Bible says in Galatians 6 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. People think they can stick their noses up at God and laugh in His face, but they cannot mock God and get away with it. Let me tell you about some men and women who tried to mock God. We begin with John Lennon, the famous Beatles singer. Some years after his murder, or before his murder, during an interview with an American magazine, this is what he said. Christianity will end. It will disappear. I do not have to argue about that. I am certain. 
Jesus was okay, but his subjects were too simple. Today we're more famous than he. Lennon, after saying that, the Beatles were more famous than Jesus Christ was shot six times. How about Tancredo Neves, the president of Brazil? During a presidential campaign, he said if he got 500,000 votes from his party, not even God would remove him from his presidency. Sure, he got the votes, but he got sick the day before his inauguration, and he died. How about Cazuza? a bisexual Brazilian composer, singer, and poet. During a show in Rio de Janeiro, while smoking a cigarette, puffed out some smoke into the air and said, God, that's for you. He died at age 32 of lung cancer in a horrible manner. How about Thomas Andrews, the man who built the Titanic? After constructing the Titanic, a reporter asked, how safe would it be? And in an ironic tone, he said this, not even God can seek the Titanic. The result, I think you all know what happened to the ship and Thomas Andrew died in those icy waters. How about Marilyn Monroe, an actress? She was visited by Billy Graham during a presentation of a show. He said, the Spirit of God has sent me to talk to you, Marilyn. And after hearing what Billy Graham had to say, she said this, I don't need your Jesus. A week later, she was found dead in her apartment. How about Bon Scott, singer, ex-vocalist of ACDC? One of his songs in 1979 said, Don't stop me, I'm going down all the way, down the highway of hell. On 19 February 1980, Bon Scott was found dead. He was choked by his own vomit. How about a group of rebellious friends in Brazil in 2005? These rebellious friends had gone to pick up a girl in her house, and they were all drunk. The mother accompanied her daughter to the car and was so worried about the drunkenness of her friends that she said to her daughter, My daughter, go with God and may He protect you. The daughter of the mother responded by saying, Only if He, God, travels in the trunk, because inside here it's already full. Hours later, news came that they had been involved in a fatal accident. Six young ladies all killed. The car could not be recognized, and the people inside could not be recognized. The only thing that was intact was the trunk of the car. The police said there was no way that the trunk could have remained intact. And to their astonishment, inside the trunk was a crate of eggs, none of which were broken. Friend, God will not be mocked. About Christine Hu, a Jamaican journalist and entertainer, she once said in an interview, the Bible is the worst book ever written and should be burned. One month later, she was found burned beyond recognition in her own car. And the list of mockers could go on and on. These and many more like them have forgotten that there is no other name that has been given so much authority as the name of Jesus. Many celebrities and athletes and worldly greats have come and gone, but only one only one rose again. Only one is still alive today. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. He will not be mocked. Only Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to his would-be followers. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. Dear hearts, we need to look around us and ask the question, how are we being influenced? Is it media? Is it our ungodly friendships? Is it the negative voices of the world? I believe that much of our media outlets have made our nation a nation of scoffers. Oh, but preacher, media doesn't influence me. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. What I do know with this is that there are billions and billions of dollars spent on advertising. Why? Advertising has influenced us to what kind of cereal we eat. 
what kind of toothpaste we buy, what kind of skin cream we put on our hands, and what kind of truck we'll drive. We are influenced by what we see, feel, and hear. Look around. How are you being influenced? Are you walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of the scornful? It's impossible to have a happy or blessed life if you're standing, walking, or sitting in places of ungodliness. But that's not all. David, he knew full well the negative consequences of these influences and how they molded his life. But he also knew about the godly influences. And just as there are stages for ungodliness, there are stages for godliness. Psalms 1-2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The blessed man, the person who makes his walk with God, he surrounds himself with godly influences. And what are those? The stages of godliness is one delighting in God's Word. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, if so you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. We started out this morning singing about the Lord is good. Friends, it's true. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Amen. Amen. Your appetite for the Lord and His Word will become dull when you have tasted too much of the world. Get back into the Word of God. Allow God's Word to speak to you. Pray and ask the Lord to give you hunger for His Word. A divine, fresh revelation of God. This Bible is God's compass for your life. Hallelujah. If you read it, then you'll find the heavenly shore. So, we not only delight in God's Word, but we also meditate on God's Word. The Bible says that we should meditate on His Word day and night, which means every season of our life should be filled with the Word of God. It's not just enough to read the Bible or to listen to it on Sunday morning. There has to be passages that penetrate our hearts. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is more than just reading casually through the Bible. There are truths that must be internalized. There are verses that must be memorized so that when the enemy comes in like the flood, hallelujah, we can stand up to Satan just as Jesus said, it is written, hallelujah. Psalms 119 is the answer. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So to make our, the most of our walk with God, we need to carefully look in three directions. And the first is this. You have to look around. How are you being influenced? Is it just the world's voices that you're listening to right now? Or are you listening to the voice of God? But secondly, we also must look inside. In other words, what are you becoming? What are you becoming? Psalms 1-3 says, You'll be like a tree that's planted by rivers of water that brings forth its season. Its leaf will not wither. And whatever it does shall prosper. Not so with the wicked. They're like chaff and it blows away. So how we're influenced will reflect on what we become in character. I encourage you today to look inside your heart. Ask yourself, what kind of person am I becoming? A person who's growing in Christ will do so in three specific areas. First, they will be fruitful. It says they'll bring forth their fruit in due season. What is a fruitful person? I like how John Piper describes it. And I quote, they are refreshing and nourishing to be around. You go away from them fed. You go away from them strengthened. You go away with your taste for spiritual things awakened. Their words are healing and convicting and encouraging and deepening and enlightening. Being around them is like a meal. A, a godly person is like a meal. 
Let me ask you, are you a meal or are you just a saltless cracker? I don't know about you, but I like a meal. Oh, yes. Get the oven stoked up. Put a nice roast in there with carrots and onions and potatoes. Get the gravy going. Get your smells. Get some salt and pepper and garlic. Woo! I want to be a meal to the world. You're fruitful. Secondly, you're durable. Since his leaf shall not wither. The hot winds may blow, the rain may not fall, but the person is planted by the rivers of water. He's planted by God's word, and while other people are withering away, he remains nourished, strong, and vibrant in his faith. Love the song, I shall not be moved. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I'm durable for God. Valley, a true person of Christ, a disciple of Christ is prosperous. Bible says whatever he does shall prosper. Well, it might take time. It might even take a lifetime. But in the end, the Bible says they will be prosperous. This is not so for the ungodly. Psalms 1-4 says this is not so for the wicked. They are like chaff, and the wind blows it away. The wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the seat of the assembly of the righteous. I'd like you to ponder this thought for a moment. For the believer, this is the only hell we'll ever see and experience. For the unbeliever, this is the only heaven they will ever see and experience. I'll say that again. For the believer, this is the only hell we will ever see and experience. For the unbeliever, this is the only heaven they will ever see and experience. Friend, whatever negative things, problems, trials, heartaches are in your life right now, well, that's the worst it can get. Because for the Christian, earth is the only hell we'll ever experience. <laughs> but our home is not the earth. Our home is heaven above. We are citizens of heaven. And the best is yet to come. We will prosper and we will be highly favored of our Heavenly Father in the end. And I ask you today, what are you becoming? Are you like a tree planted by the rivers of water? Are you growing in Christ? Are you producing good fruit in your life? I Valley in our walk with God, first we saw that we must look around. In other words, how are you being influenced? And then you have to look inside. What are you becoming? Lastly, we must look ahead. How will your life end? In a British cemetery, you can find these words on a capstone. Pause, my friend, as you walk by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. A visitor had seen this and then added the words, To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Friend, destiny is determined not by chances, but by choices. By choices. Choices, big and small, determine our destiny in life. Allow me to illustrate. A certain courthouse in Ohio stands in a unique location. Raindrops that fall on the north side of the building go into Lake Ontario and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. While those falling on the south side go into the Mississippi River and all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. At precisely the point of the peak of the roof, just a gentle puff of wind can determine the destiny of those raindrops. It will make a difference of more than 2,000 miles as their final destination. The spiritual application is clear. By the smallest deed or choice of words, we might set in motion 
influences that could change the course of our life and the lives of others, which will affect our eternal destiny. There is a destiny we will all be part of. Up ahead, the Bible talks about a day of reckoning. Will you be judged among the ungodly? The ungodly will not be able to stand on that day. They'll have no leg to stand on. They'll not have an excuse before Almighty God. They've already made all their excuses why they can't belong to a church or relationship with Jesus. Why they can't be saved today. Why there's so many hypocrites in the church. Excuses, excuses. But on that day, they won't have a lady to stand on. In heaven, there'll only be one congregation. The congregation of the righteous. There'll be no sinners in that congregation. Jesus will separate the sheep and the goats. Heaven's gates will be filled with the congregation of the redeemed. The congregation of those that have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Dear hearts, are you in that congregation? Oh, I pray so. At the beginning of this message, I said these words. Time is a precious commodity. No one knows the day or the hour that their life will be required of them. The Bible says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. Jesus knows the way of the righteous. He knows his own. He knows their ways. And so to make the most of our walk with God, we must first look around. And I ask you today, how are you being influenced? Are you walking, standing, sitting with the ungodly? Or are you influenced by God's book and God's people? Then you look inside what are you becoming? Are you becoming a fruitful disciple of Christ? Are you a durable tree of life to those that are around you? If not, why not? In a moment, we'll celebrate communion together. What a perfect time to look inside, to examine ourselves and say, Lord, transform my mind. Transform my heart. Let me be a tree of life to those that are around me. Then we look ahead. How will your life end? It was two years ago that my father's life ended. I miss him. I miss his laughter, his jokes, none of which were funny. Today I really miss it. Best thing about my dad is I know where he's spending eternity. He's spending eternity with Jesus right now. His life ended well. Will you be in the congregation of the righteous? Or will you be judged among the ungodly? Life is short. Time is precious. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, we pause to reflect on you. We look around. We see, God, there are things that might be influencing our lives that are displeasing. Lord, we also look inside. And in our heart of hearts, we want to be more like you, Jesus. So in a moment, as we take the cup, the bread into our hands, Lord, help your church take a deep look, an internal look as to what we're becoming. We don't want to be like the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia. 
Lord, we want to be a church that's on fire for you. But a people growing fruit in our lives, trees of righteousness. So we look ahead. And we're the ones that determine our future. Because Jesus, you've already done all you can do. But now it's our choice. Will our steps fall on the right or on the left? Or will we stay on that narrow road close to you? As your heads are bowed, say, Pastor, today, I've been being influenced by the wrong things in my life. I've been listening to the wrong voices. And I know my life is not pleasing to God. Today, I want to surrender my heart to Jesus choice is yours. Right now, the Holy Spirit is drawing you. And He's saying, make the right choice. Make the right choice. Make the right choice. Only you know where you're at with God. And only you can look inside. Then you say, Pastor, I want to make the right choice. I want to surrender my heart to Jesus. That Jesus, lift your hand up right now. I want to pray for you. Yes, God, thank you, thank you. Thank you, friend. You're making the right choice. Thank you. In a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask for our friends to come, our service to begin to serve communion among us. Hallelujah.